for the first pick up for our uh, afternoon session, we'll have Ibu Ba from Johns Hopkins University to talk about one of the most many geography and drinks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for putting together this meeting. Unlike the other ones, I don't have to travel far. I just have to hop on the train for an hour. Um, so I will tell you about some work that came out uh, at the end of the summer with Fabio, Federico, and, and Sakura. Two of them are in the crowd. Um, and I also realized I am the first to talk about aspects of generalized symmetry. So I will give a brief introduction of these ideas. All right. So where do we start? Let's see. Things don't work. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, there's a lag. Interesting. OK, so in recent times, we've seen the notion of global symmetry in quantum systems have a very, very large generalization in, in various ways, all of which are very interesting. And we have very, we don't have a complete picture of understanding of, of what this tells us in general. Well, the idea is we should think of global symmetry as implementing topological operators in quantum systems. Okay, so both of these ideas separately we're used to thinking about, but somehow they are related. And I'll try to be a little bit more precise, which that should mean. Very good. So intuitively, we can go back to bread and butter physics that we learn in quantum mechanics. Um, when we say we have a symmetry in quantum mechanics, we want something that commutes with the Hamiltonian, and this statement should be invariant under our G flow. Um, given the, the renormalized Hamiltonian at any scale, the operator that I give you it should commute with the Hamiltonian. What this means, of course, having symmetries gives you constants of constants of motion that are preserved uh, under time evolution and renormalization, and this is super powerful in understanding selection sectors, among other things. So this new picture of symmetry, the way it works is let's consider what, what I would call ordinary symmetries. These are implemented by co-dimension one topological operators, uh, meaning that we're used to inserting an operator to measure its charge, we integrate some current along some co-dimension one surface. Uh, such a surface actually is topological and the fact that it's topological or such an, such an insertion in the topological process meaning it depends on sigma in a way that's, that's invariant under small fluctuations. And this would be a consequence of another theorem uh, um, in the case of sym continuous symmetries that we're used to thinking about. In general, topological operators could be used to implement both continuous and discrete symmetries. In the case of discrete, you just want to insert an operator and across the operator, you have a discrete uh, gauge transformation that you would have to do. So there is a notion of fusion of two operators, which, which follows some group structure in, 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 in ordinary symmetry, where if I insert an operator on some surface sigma labeled with some element G, and then I multiply the two, then I take the product of the two operators, they should give me an operator whose label is the product under the group uh, operation, okay? So now, um, of course, quantum systems can also have a spectrum of extended operators. So this is the first level of generalization that we come across. And keys can be charged under higher form symmetry. Right? So for example, you can have Wilson lines and tilt lines, and then you have topological operators that take value on higher co-dimension surfaces, uh, which would measure the charge associated to such extended operators. And this we usually call also the p-form symmetry. Even further, we have a notion of what, this, what something that is meant by non-invertible symmetry. So if we ask just the question, given a quantum systems, what are the symmetry operators, meaning what are the set of operators that commute with a Hamiltonian, uh, such a set doesn't have to admit a group structure. There is nothing in that statement that told you that it should admit a group structure. And, and in fact, what you might expect is when you multiply two of such operator, which corresponds to taking two of these surfaces on top, you get something that has a non-trivial fusion structure with some fusion structure constant here. This sort of a condition implies that in general, 
if you have your set of operators, we, we expect there to be a notion of daggering, which is an involution into the set, um, that if I take an operator and conjugate, I do not get that entity operator, but an identity operator plus other stuff, okay? So this is a notion of what we mean by non-invertible symmetry, means I have a set of symmetry generators, symmetry operators, where if I multiply under some conjugation, I don't get that entity operator, but I get identity plus other stuff. Okay. Um, and, and, and the idea is it's not invertible, meaning when I, when I insert such a surface, I cannot undo it simply by adding some time reversal or orientation reversal uh, 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 object. Very good. So this is a right. This is a rather seems a novel thing. However, in space time with less than three, we've seen many examples of this. This is Verlinde lines in Kramer one year duality of Eisen model, the self dual point. You can have operators, symmetry operators that satisfy these properties. So they are not new in the larger context of lower D uh, QFT. However, what has happened in recently is that there have been procedures that allowed us to generate many examples in simple bread and butter theories, many examples of such a symmetry in, in theories like QED or QCD. This should be 2017, not 1970. Although you, I'm sure you, you could have figured it out. But anyway, so uh, starting with a rather nice work of Yuji, and then with these papers coming some time later, usually this this three four years lag is 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 custom for things that UG does. Um, there have been a machine that have allowed us to generate many examples in simple bread and butter QFT. Okay, so this is where the excitement comes in about then what do these symmetries do, and and what do they tell us about these physical systems that we already supposedly understood. So I will not try to answer this question here. I will actually add to the complexity in this talk. But since then, we've seen a huge growing literature of not, what's, what's, what's called non-invertible symmetries, categorical symmetries. There is quite a bit of work done by the Oxford group and, and, and so on. But in all of these things are within the context of QFT using QFT methods. There is something that many of us supposedly know how to do well, which is, string theory, and some of us also know holography, and it's a very natural question to ask, under holography, how do I see these non-invertible symmetries? And are these things in strings already? And if so, how should we understand them? In fact, they are. And, and from the perspective, from the perspective of string theory, the existence of these things aren't super surprising. So the idea which is I want to answer, the question that I want to address, in this talk is the following. Consider we have some bulk boundary set up. We know we can insert some operator here. It could be a local operator, it could be extended operator. In the bulk, this gets attached to something like a Wilson line uh, inside. So in a field theory boundary, I can insert an operator, uh, a topological operator to measure the charge. What you would like to know is if you let this thing drop in the bulk, what should be its bulk avatar? And how should you describe such an object? Okay. So that is a question we want to understand. I will try to address this in the context of ADS-CFT. However, the statements that I will make are general, but this is a context where we're familiar with where certain statements can be made sharp. Okay, and so we this topic. Okay, very good. So as soon as you ask this question, there's two parts to it. One. There is a bottom-up picture, meaning if I give you some ADS supergravity theory and I give you some effective supergravity just in ADS, we should know how to reconstruct the field theory from that data. You can ask what is the description of this operator that I've dropped in the bulk. You can also ask it another way. We strongly think that ADS-CFT is strictly part of uh, string theory, so if I give you an ADS background with some compact uh, directions, either in string theory or in M theory, you could also ask, is there a stringy object that captures such an operator here? So in the first case, 
you can show that if I give you some effective supergravity theory, then there is a Gauss law constraint in the bulk theory that allows you to capture such a symmetry operators. And if you push this up to a string or, or an M theory, such an operator gets realized by some brain systems. Okay. And I'll try to describe each one of these uh, separately. Go ahead. It's clear that there is a pressure as well. Sometimes you introduce one pressure to the boundary, and if it does, it creates like a tube in the wall. Yeah, so you, could, you, 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 can, you can create a tube that, 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 that goes inside, but there is an intuition of, of holography that if I have such a thing and I extend it, I should ask, is there an operator that, for example, links with this, right? And then there's, of course, the question that if you have such an operator that links with it, is it naturally identifiable with whatever you would draw, okay? So the, the tube and, and this thing are, are, are different. Or you can also think of the tube that you get as some sort of uh, roll sheet extension of it. Um, and this is natural in this picture of the gas law constraint of how to think about it. And I hope that you can ask me that question again. Go ahead. Have a question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, first, let's, let's understand the first part. How do I extract these things in a sort of bottom up picture of, of, of so let's consider a U1 preform gauge symmetry with some gauge transformation that we that I give in this way. Um, one thing that, is, that we know is in, if you, whenever we do Hamiltonian quantization of gauge theory, there are gas law constraints, which simply follows from the fact that if I pick a time direction, the effective Lagrangian of my system is independent from the time component of the gauge field. So this, so when I look at this, this, this variation, I get some non-trivial operator that must vanish, uh, uh, um, that, 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 must, that, that vanishes classically, but quantum mechanically, you would impose it as a constraint onto your state. So, so one thing we want to do, however, if I go up in quantum mechanics, so let's, let me draw this more, more specifically, you have some bulk supergravity theory, you have some gauge symmetry, and you take a constant time slice. In the case of ADS-CFT, we will take the time direction to be the radial direction. And, part of, uh, and then you can ask, what is happening on a constant time slice here? Okay. So what we learn in, 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 in Hamiltonian quantization, you impose the Gauss law as a constraint on, on states. And the constraint that imposes is that it generates local, it generates gauge transformation along such a surface at constant time. Okay. So part of this, of what I will tell you, is, is built on from work of uh, Bell of Moore uh, some, 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 some time ago. So now we want to think about then this operator more carefully for what we want to do. Um, now, one of the statements that follows is whenever you compute this, this Gauss law, it's, it's going to be a closed object. And in fact, it generates local gauge transformation by using this P, which we call the page charge. Okay, so if I exponentiate, uh, I can define always an operator at constant time slices, which generates the gauge transformation by simply moving the derivative on the other side. And I have exposed this page charge here. So if you consider now a specific class of gauge transformations, ones that are singular, which localize onto some surface sigma P, then you immediately observe that you obtain an operator which is which measures the phase charge along some 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 surface. And what we will do, we'll identify this operator as the object that is defined along the 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 thing that we drop in the bulk. And we will see why this is a natural thing to do. Good. So in general, there are a couple of interesting caveats to point out. If I write down the phase charge, it's not going to be a gauge invariant object. It's not going to be a globally well-defined object. So both of these features are important because by, by the time I have to move the derivative on the other side, I, in order to obtain something that is globally well-defined and also invariant under certain gauge transformation, I will require some sort of improvement that I have to add, that I have to shift to the page charge with. So the operator that you typically define that, that you construct that is well-defined is going to add some new degrees of freedom 
that goes away by the time I go back to reconstructing the Gauss law. Okay. To what step this part is unique, this improvement. Very good. So there could be many different improvements that you can do, but there will be the physical information will depend on some, some specific set of choices, some specific set of data. And so data you can understand more sharply as usually when you add this, 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 this operator on, on, on some surface, there is some bulk anomaly inflow that you would sort of cancel, right? It's not exactly that, but there is a picture of that that you can sort of come up with. And in fact, that's what controls the allowed things you can add here. You can have more than one choice, but, but there is some invariant data, which is the thing that's gonna show up when you compute physical data. But I'll work out an example so you can see, okay? So the interesting part here is by the time I go from constructing this operator and improving it in a way that is well defined in the bulk, this leads to a new class of operators in the bulk, which generically are going to be non-invertible. What that means here, here there's a natural action of daggering, which I can take a complex conjugation, I can multiply two, and you will see that um, uh, this naturally leads to things that, that are non-invertible and things that are not group-like. And interestingly enough, um, in ADS-CFT, these operators have always been there, right? So, so, so there's always the question when we talk about symmetry in, in ADS-CFT, we always focus on the boundary value of the gauge field, which generates uh, the, the symmetry current in the boundary. But there is an operator associated to, that, to those symmetry currents. We don't usually talk about them. And this is an explicit construction of what those operators are, OK? And the interesting thing to observe is even from the beginning in ads -CFT, such an operator that would measure the charge from the bulk that generates the symmetry in the bulk are going to be non-invertible. Okay, you can just think of the simplest case you like, just U1 gauge theory in the bulk. Let's say, suppose you add some, some, some A cube churn Simon's coupling and you compute the Gauss law, you get a non-invertible symmetry in the bulk. But there are the very, clever thing that the theory does as you push that to the boundary that makes it invertible. And I can, if you're curious, I can show you how that works later. Not in these slides, okay? So, so this was a picture from a bottom of ADS. Then the question you ask, you can ask next is, um, if we put this whole thing in string theory, what is this operator? And the, the bulk operator that, that appears here you can, we can construct by taking some D brain states that wrap some submanifold inside X. And the requirement is that these brains have to be stable, not necessarily calibrated, right? Stability and calibration are different. We want them at least to be stable so we can talk about them, so we can push them around. So this, this shouldn't be a statement of supersymmetry or, or anything, uh, 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 or any sort of additional structure. It should just be there. Go ahead. Okay. Very good. So here, alpha, here, so when I do this, right, so this, this I consider a simple gauge field, so that's a U1. So alpha is the gauge parameter that you would associate with this. So, so the gauge parameter appears here. Um, you know, in this talk, you can just go ahead and compute this very fast for U1 gauge theory with a triple, with a churn simons coupling, and you would get an operator that's going to be not invertible. Okay, very good. So here, so now the brains that you want, they, they're, they're going to be something extended along my constant time slice, uh, where again, the time is my radio direction. Something nice happens when I consider such a brain which is that if I look at their effective action, the kinetic term has the effective tension, which is being renormalized by the ADS scale. And then there's the West Domino term that left over, which is independent from symmetric. The reason why this is interesting is because of, of this term. What it means is that as I push this operator closer to the boundary, the tension goes to infinity and the degrees of freedom on the brain basically decouple. Right, so the degree of freedom on the brain freeze, and the only thing that you're left is the topological sector, 
which in, indeed becomes the, is the way how you see a bulk dynamical operator becomes topological when you push it to the bound. Okay, so you can compare these two and you can see uh, what happens. And this is, of course, just the magic of the setup of brains themselves. So, the, so if you want to construct then this operator, we can find the suitable brains and then study the West Amino coupling and see what it gives us in the page. And this should also be compatible with the page charge construction that we described in the previous slides. Okay, so this is a statement that I just said. So the residual West Amino term is going to be the action uh, that, in the, that couples to the bulk field that gives you the topological operator. So the another thing you, you could ask then is another part of the data in telling you the symmetry operators, as we described earlier, is that they have a fusion. I can take two of them and then they act as a third operator or some of other operators which behave in interesting way. In particular, you can ask if I take a symmetry operator and I take its conjugate, we know that this can give you something non-invertible. And the way that shows up in the bulk is that if I take a DP brain with some data on the brain and I take its conjugate on the brain, we know this doesn't give you identity, but it gives you some sum of lower brains. Okay, the tachyon condensate or other physical processes. So, so the fact that this statement is true in string theory, and then we identified these operators uh, with some brain operators immediately gives you a sort of very top-down picture of how, how and why, or much more physical picture of how and why you get to experience um, um, non-invertible symmetry. Okay, so that was some broad statement. Everything that I've told you so far also works if I consider a boundary that is not a conformal boundary. If I have a hard boundary, not an ADS boundary, you can also make similar statements of, of that kind. Okay, so now I'll try to work a specific example where we can realize these things. Any questions? Go ahead. So if you I is un invertible in the boundary. Good, good. So you can have boundary operators that are invertible, but the bulk is not. The example that I just told you, just compute, take a U1 with a churn Simon coupling, you'll see this. But the but the but the thing that happens there, just in ADS, just in, in pure ADS, is that if you compute the page charge, is given just by star F. But because of the churn simons term, you get an F squared term. So, 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 to, to you, so you want to pull a derivative from star F plus F squared. So pulling it from F, F squared basically induces the churn simons on the operator. Uh, so another churn simons on, uh, on, on the surface by which we're defining the operator. So, so, so the symmetry generator of the U1 with, 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 with a U1 gauge theory in the bulk is genuinely not invertible. But the thing that, that saves you is that as you push, it, it, the thing that saves you is that in ADS CFT, I have to pick a boundary condition for the gauge field. But when you pick a boundary condition for the gauge field, this is a thing that trivializes this, this churn simons term, and then you recover the invertible uh, symmetry. But that doesn't always happen. And when it doesn't happen, that's when you get non trivial, non invertible symmetry, which I will demonstrate. Good. So here it doesn't, right? And this was the question that Miguel was asking earlier. Because here is it's a, it's a loop that I just dropped. I do not change the code dimension because I don't want it to be an operator that ends on the boundary because this has a different meaning. Right? Yeah, in the, in the, the, the um, you mean if I don't have a, 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 a proper idea? Good. So in that case, I don't have a good answer yet. I don't have a good answer how it should work in the non-conformal case. But, but you have to be careful. You have to mean, what do you mean by non-conformal? If I say non-conformal where I have an asymptotically locally ADS, this always works, right? So the question that you ask is, if I were to have a hard boundary, how I should think about that? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I have some more specific ideas to this, but but it's not ready for prime time, but we can talk about it later. Very good. But yeah, but the point is, if you are asymptotically locally ADS, it just this just follows from from the standard ADS CSD picture. But if you're not, you have to think a bit more. Um, well, actually, I can tell you what the answer has to look like. What the answer has to look like is the, is the thing that if you take the kinetic modes, right, you have to, because it becomes then a second order problem, then you have to pick boundary conditions for those. So you actually kill the kinetic terms by that. Okay, so that, that's really where with the physics, why it works in, in general. It's just that it happens in ADS, that process gets dragged out. So you could see it happening. With them. But that's all it is, right? Even there, you can feel it up. Okay, very good. So let's continue. So let's talk about this example where you could see things uh, explicitly. Um, let's consider ADS5 on T11 with M units of F3 flux. Okay, so these F3 flux are, are wrapped on, 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 on the three cycle of T11. So here, when N is multiplied to M, this is a duality cascade, which ends, which we know ends N equal to one super Yang mill theory. So then the UV picture that we have here should have the same symmetry structure as N equal to one super Yang mill theory. And, and this allows us to study it in this context. So this, the N equal to one super Yang mill theory has an interesting Z2M zero form symmetry and a ZM one form symmetry. The ZM one form symmetry uh, is acting on, 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 on Wilson line, for example. So the, 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 the zero form symmetry um, itself descends a would be U1R symmetry, which is broken by the ABJ anomaly. Okay. And one of the interesting things that's known about this case is that from the ABJ anomaly, there is a sort of leftover avatar uh, of it. Even though you break the, the, the U1 down to a Z2M, the ABJ actually generates a Tooft anomaly between the one form symmetry and the zero form symmetry. Okay. So having this Tooft anomaly tells you that if I gauge one, the other one is going to be broken and, 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 and so forth. <clears throat> now, if I gauge the one form symmetry here, as we just said, it breaks the zero form symmetry. Um, but one of the things that you can see is that this, this, this symmetry can be recovered as a, as a non-invertible symmetry. And the difference between the two is that if I take super yang mill theory and, it has, and I take the ZM one form symmetry, which is really the center symmetry, if I gauge it, then I go to PSUM theory. So what this means is that the super Yang mills with SU, SUM global, 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 uh, uh, global sim, SUM gauge symmetry, where, 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 where the, the gauge group is genuinely SUM, um, have uh, invertible symmetries. But if I gauge the center symmetry, then the PSUM theory, which is SUM mod ZM, has a one form symmetry, has a non invertible. Uh, 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 zero form symmetry. Okay, so we want to understand the zero form symmetry in how, how it emerges in this holographic setting. So to study this problem, as I just said, we look at the UV of this setup. So in the UV, um, <clears throat> with 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 I've given you the UV data. It's 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 ADS five times T one one with m units of uh, of 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 F three flux. This problem alone, I can compute the effective uh, gravity action. There is a topological sector and there is a kinetic part. The topological sector is constrained by various uh, Bianchi identity. So all of these fields descend from the flux upstairs. The key point that I want to draw your attention to here is that I can compute the effective 5D supergravity. It has a topological part. It is customary to organize the topological part of a, of, of, of a supergravity theory as an action that lives in one dimension higher. And that's why I wrote it this way. Also, when I write it this way is I want to be able to pull out a D, an overall derivative and get the 5D action. But now this point can be subtle for the following reason. Um, suppose I take one of these fields G2 
I could introduce a, a, a one form gauge field, but this is being Spickelberg away by the B2 field, which is coming from actually the NS and B2 field. One thing you can do is you separate out the piece which is takes on, uh, which is valued in, in, in appropriate cohomology group. So in this case, um, we pull out these pieces, they're valued in, 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 in appropriate cohomology group. So this is a non-trivial part of these forms. So G2, F1, when I solve this Bianchette entity, these are the non-trivial parts of these forms here. So here you could already see a couple of interesting that's happening. You have a gauge field A1, which is defines in the bulk for you a U1 gauge theory. However, this U1 gauge theory is being Spickelberged away by this term here to a Z2M, right? This is how you see the Z2M, uh, uh, this zero form symmetry in the bulk. On the other hand, if I look at the B2, which defines a one form gauge symmetry in the bulk, it's also being Spickelberged away by this term here, okay? So you get a ZM one form symmetry, and this is how you see the symmetry in, 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 in holography. Good, so when I now take this action and I pull a derivative, there are a couple of terms. I see a BF term for the discrete symmetry that we just talked about, both for the one form symmetry and the zero form symmetry. Oh, this is dead. Okay, this is dead. So, and then you have the zero form symmetry here, but the, the thing that is new is this term, right? And this term, you have this G2B that's appearing here. This was the data. This is a non-trivial data that, that, that's coming from, that you can associate to the B2 field, okay? And it's valued in some cohomology group. And this term is a mixed anomaly between the zero form symmetry and the one form symmetry, okay? So this mixed anomaly term is going to do interesting things for us. Uh, this is dead. Did it work? Good, so when I now compute the Gauss plot for this, uh, associated to A1, which is a zero form symmetry, I get two pieces. I get a piece like this, and I have this piece appearing uh, next to it. And to try to compute the phase charge, um, I would need to basically pull a derivative from this guy, okay, to pull a derivative from this guy. However, this is something that I cannot simply do because this is an element in cohomology. I cannot simply pull a derivative out, but you can instead replace this integral with a path integral over some uh, fictitious uh, gauge field A coupled to G2. And this should be reminiscent to, to, to uh, the, uh, okay? So then I can pull back this operator on the boundary of some M4, and indeed define an operator on a pre match fold, which would be my non invertible, which, is, which would be the thing that I'm looking for. So, in the end of the day, I get this operator that I would construct as being the operator that degenerates the symmetry transformation associated to A1. And, and it has a piece which is standard from string theory. But then it has a churn simons term coupled to it in a very specific way. Okay. So indeed, if you take this operator and you multiply it with its, with its conjugate, you don't get one, but you get something that we call a condensate that lives on, on, on this three-dimensional space. Any questions? So in the field theory, this is exactly the thing that tells us what we want. Um, so let, let me just go through this fast. Good. Thing doesn't work. Are you passing? Good, thank you. So in the field theory, there are two choices of what can happen, right? So in one case, I want to fix, I want to consider the, the, the dual of pure, uh, the dual of SUN super Yang new theory. Right, where the global form of the gauge group is, is SUM. So to do this, I have to pick boundary conditions, meaning I have to pick a boundary condition which would pick A1 and G2B. 
But fixing G to be in the boundary tells me that I, it's just a number. I can just fix the number. And if I can fix a number, then it just appears as an overall phase. So this term isn't going to be important. And I'm just left with the standard operator in the SUM case, which is invertible. Next slide. However, if I want the PSUM case, then I need to integrate or, or I need to sum over the G2 choices. And when I have to do this, I can, I can no longer, yeah, you have another one? Thank you. Okay. Wait, is it working? Oh. Okay, very good. If I don't have to integrate, if I, if I have to sum over G to B, I cannot simply replace it with a constant. In that case, I have a full non-invertible operator that goes all the way to the boundary of the space, which is non-trivial, right? So this is the two differences here. And the differences here is just a choice of a boundary condition. The boundary conditions in the first case is such that I can throw away this G to B data because it's a constant phase for the operator. But in the second case, I cannot throw it away because it's a part of a dynamical field from which I have to sum over in the path integral in quantum gravity. And in that case, I get a genuine non-invertible symmetry that survives to the boundary. Okay. So now the next question you can ask, how does this show up in the brain? I think Sakura will talk a little bit more about brain, so I'll try to be faster here. So you can ask, what are the brains that generate uh, these symmetries? Uh, you can go back and look at where this T3 came from in, in our constructions. It came from reducing the seven form flux that is dual to F3 on the tree sphere. So this exactly corresponds to the operators that, 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 that you would get by taking D5 brain wrapped on the tree sphere. If I take a D5 brain wrapped on the tree sphere, then the leading term of such, a such an operator is exactly going to be this T3. And the gauge field that we obtain in the supergravity in this rather non, where, where, we, where we sort of had to fake our way to constructing the operator actually corresponds to the bulk gauge field that lives on the five brain. So this is surprising. So in some sense, somehow the low, the low, dimension, the low energy supergravity somehow knows about the bulk fields that would come from the brains, even though uh, I don't have the brains in this, in this picture directly. So from this picture, several things becomes clearer. You can take this D5 brain on the F3, and you can take the, its conjugate, uh, which is the anti-D5 brain. And if you multiply them, you get a non-trivial expression indeed, and that non-trivial expression that you get on the right-hand side, you can understand as coming from uh, D3 brains that live on the D5, but then wrap uh, an S2 inside the tree sphere. Okay, so, and then this you can check. This has been being studied more carefully by a couple of my students at, at, at Hopkins. So the story that, and then you can also do something else. You can ask if I just take two of these uh, D5 and you multiply them, then something cool happens where you get uh, uh, Meyer's effect, where the D5, the, the, the stack of D5 on this S3, because you have an entry B field in this system, you get a Meyer's effect that lifts this to a seven brain that's wrapping the full T11. Okay. And then the picture that seems to emerge here is that you, you do this analysis, whether you do it from low energy supergravity or whether you do it in string theory, you see all of these field theory operators, when you drop them in the bulk, they become brain. And all of the, non all of the interesting features of categorical symmetry that seem to emerge, seem to emerge completely from the dynamics of the brains themselves. And this connects then what we know in string theory to, what, to, to all of these novel ideas that, that are being studied. And this provides you a very new picture on, on studying generalized symmetry. Okay, so, so in, this, in this talk, we talk about some aspects of generalized symmetries in holography. How do we realize these symmetries? How do we build them? But the upshot, the key thing here is that uh, um, there are two, two interesting things that, that we observe. 
One, if I give you some low energy supergravity theory, you can reconstruct the non-invertible non symmetries. And then if you go into string theory of M theory, you can realize those objects also as D brain. So something that, 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 that was that certainly new to me before work, doing, this, do, doing this work, I did not know how effective supergravity theories would recover something like the West Amino coupling of a brain, but somehow it does through this Gauss law. This is the first sort of story where this picture is, is explicitly realized. It also tells us that the non-invertible symmetries and categorical symmetry that we're starting to explore in string theory is quite natural, it, that we're starting to explore in quantum field theory is quite natural within the context of string theory. And it should provide us with many examples and many new perspectives on how to study them in general. And of course, there are many people in the audience who are studying these things. And one of the important lessons here is that the theory of brains, which is K-theory, should somehow also be intimately related to generalized symmetries, uh, which is something we all wish to understand. I'll stop here. Very good. <laughs> So let's have the three questions together, and then we'll go to Matthew. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Brian. I remember you talked about you know, all the years ago, they were raising the ball, 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 Good. Yeah. So, so, so all of these in, 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 in so in the, super, the supergravity, all of these things are very dynamical objects, right? And, 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 and that is a point, right? In supergravity, we expect everything to be dynamical. So what we show in our paper is that you, when you take these objects that are very dynamical in the bulk, you can split them into two sets. One set is those that gives you to, you know, what we standard think about bulk boundary operators, and, and we know how to think about that, and that's very lovely. One of the things that we're adding is that there's another set, which somehow we don't usually talk about, but they're there, and those are the set of objects that, that we don't end on the boundary, but we can take them parallel to the boundary. Those seem to generate topological objects, okay? And, and, and that's where the split is. That there's a choice being made in ADSCFT, which is the choice of a boundary condition, and that choice of a boundary condition is splitting your states in the bulk as being some being topological and some giving being dual to dynamical up. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was sure. Um, the end is that we Ah, where? In the, so, like, you will be odd. Good. So, good. 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 So in the field theory analysis, there's a choice. There's a there's a there's a bound on M. But in 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 inside, when we do analysis in the bulk, there isn't any re restriction of M that leaves that I'm aware of. I don't know where is Fabio. Fabio. Let me show them the the yeah, so there's a dependence of spin structure when, when, when M is odd. But our analysis in the bulk, we assume that we have a spin structure. So there is a restriction you can imagine putting, right? But so far, it's, it's, it, it doesn't show up in this computation. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I have to apply in the filtering. It's just for M. I think what could be interesting is if we understood how 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 fermionic generators work. I think if you start studying fusions with those operators, you might see a distinction, and this hasn't been. Right. Yeah, I also understand the uh, 